Hey guys, Will here. So you might remember a while back now, we took a look at the Sigma Integrale DK2 motion system. Now today in the studio, we have its bigger brother, the DK2 Plus. One of the things that makes Sigma Integrale really interesting in the motion space is they use purely telemetry based effects rather than any canned effects. So what does that actually mean in terms of the driving experience and how does this compare to other competitor products? Well, that's what we're gonna be checking out in today's video. So stay tuned. So before we dive into the DK2 Plus today, firstly, a couple of bits of important information for you to be aware of. So firstly, a big thank you to Sigma Integrale for sending across the DK2 Plus for us to check out. Now, when we reviewed the DK2, we did uh, end up sending that back to them after a couple of months of testing. I assume that they're gonna want this guy back as well. So it's important that you guys are aware there is a little bit of a variance there with some of the different motion systems. Usually when we review stuff here, we try to hold on to it so we can compare it down the line to, uh, to other products as well as cover product evolution. Obviously these are very expensive systems. Sigma Integrale is a small company. So I assume they're gonna probably want this back at some point. Some of the other motion systems that we're comparing to in today's video have been sent to us to hold on to. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Now it doesn't have any influence in terms of, you know, how we preference certain products or anything like that. We don't need any more sim racing gear here and we're certainly not motivated by the accumulation of gear in any way, but it is important that you guys have the full context. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Now we don't have any direct affiliate partners for the Sigma Integrale system systems at this point in time. We do have some affiliate partners for some of the competitor products. So if you decide you wanna pick up any of the gear that you see in today's video, just check down in the links down below just to see whether there is an option available for you to help support the channel at no additional cost. But as is always the case here, everything I'm gonna be talking about today is purely just my own observations, my own opinions of the product. And we have been very, very impressed with the DK2 Plus just like we were with the DK2. So let's jump in now, starting with some pricing information. So as I quickly mentioned in the intro, the DK2 Plus does sit above the DK2, as kind of makes sense. There is also a DK6 system available from Sigma Integrale, which offers even more travel than the DK2 and DK2 Plus do. And as at this point in time, at least they're top of the line system. Now we haven't had any experience with that yet, but hopefully we'll get to experience in the not too distant future. Now Sigma Integrale are a US based company, which means we are gonna be giving all our prices today in US dollars. So the DK2 Plus comes in at 6,740 US dollars, goes without saying, of course, you do need to factor in your local shipping costs, import duties, taxes, and whatnot on top of that. So to put that in perspective, that comes in around about $1,000 more than the DK2 system is that we looked at previously, and about $2,000 US less expensive than the DK6 system, if that is the one that you're interested in. It does come with a three-year warranty from Sigma Integrale, and if we compare that pricing-wise across to some of the other competitors that we've had experience with here at Boosted Media, the D-Box G54250i system comes in at around about $1,250. 50 US dollars more expensive. And the Cubic Systems QS220 that we looked at not so long ago here was around 1700 US dollars more expensive. But again, of course, depending on where you are in the world, they may end up being a much closer comparison in terms of price. So do your own research there. Now it is also worth mentioning there is a three actuator configuration available from Sigma Integrale for the DK2 and DK2 Plus, and that does come in considerably cheaper as well. So we might do some experimenting with the three actuator setup a little bit later on, but for now, we're gonna be just looking at the four actuator setup. So I'm not gonna make this video hours long by going into all the specs and comparisons between all those different systems that we've mentioned. You guys can go back and check out our previous reviews of those systems to check out the specs there and see how exactly they compare. But I will give you a quick rundown between the DK2 and DK2 Plus here. So in simple terms, the DK2 Plus system is able to handle heavier payloads and also has a higher torque rating. But we'll go through those specs quickly for you now. So the three actuator configuration of the DK2 has a maximum payload of 170 kilograms or 375 pounds. Comparing that across to the DK2 Plus in the three actuator configuration, 272 kilograms or 600 pounds. So quite a big jump up there in terms of payload. Now that might sound like a lot of weight. Of course, that does also include the weight of the driver or anything else that is sitting inside the rig or being supported by the actuators. So for me, I'm around about 90 kilograms. So, you know, you add the weight of the rig, the wheelbase, the pedals, the actual frame, all those bits and pieces on top of it, you can get close to that very, very quickly if you're a similar kind of size to me at least. Uh, the four actuator configuration for the DK2, you're looking at 227 kilogram payload or 500 pounds. With the four actuator version of the DK2 Plus, that jumps up to 363 kilograms 
or 800 pounds. So where that lands is uh, the three actuator configuration for the DK2 actually ends up not being able to handle the kind of weight that I put on it, including my own weight, whereas the three actuator version with the DK2 Plus would be absolutely fine at 272 kilograms, as I'm sure would be for most people. So just make sure you factor that in. That may be a reason in and of itself to go for the DK2 Plus rather than the DK2, even before we get into the differences in driving experience. Now, in terms of torque rating, the DK2 has a peak torque torque rating of 4.4 Newton meters. The uh, RMS torque rating is 0.9 Newton meters, and the acceleration is 8.4 inches per second at 2,520 RPM. The DK2 Plus peak torque is 4.9 Newton meters, so not a whole lot more than what we have with the DK2, but the RMS torque is 1.5 Newton meters, which is quite a bit more than what we have with the DK2. Now, in terms of speed, this is a little bit interesting. The DK2 has a speed of 8.4 inches per second at 2,520. RPM, whereas the DK2 Plus is actually a little bit lower at 7.93 inches per second at 2,380 RPM. Now, it has been quite some time since I drove with DK2. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do a direct side-by-side -side comparison, but I can tell you that this thing felt extremely aggressive and violent, I would describe it as. So absolutely no complaints there whatsoever in terms of responsiveness or sharpness. So just to give you a quick rundown on power draw as well, the DK2 has an average system draw of 290 watts. So obviously, there will be peaks higher than that as it moves quickly, but if you average it out 290 watts, the DK2 Plus system has an average system draw of 330 watts. So not too much more thirsty there, which I thought was quite interesting. Now, both the DK2 and the DK2 Plus have a uh, total of 50 millimeters or two inches of actuator travel. So what that means is in its idle position, it will sit in the middle of that range. It can either move up or down from there. You can imagine if one side's moving up and one side's moving down, it gives you that full two inches of travel on either side. And then of course, what you actually feel sitting in the rig is then multiplied on top of that, depending on how far you are away from the actuators and how they're actually physically laid out on the rig. But we'll get into setup a little bit later on in today's video. So that gives you the basic comparison in terms of specs between the DK2 and the 2 Plus. Of course, there is the DK6 on top of that as well, which we'll be looking at hopefully in a later video. Now, another important thing to note here before we get into having a closer look at the physical hardware is I mentioned earlier that they are a US based company. That means they actually do design and manufacture and test all of their equipment in house in California in the US, which I'm sure a lot of people will be happy about. So let's jump in now and take a closer look at the hardware itself. Okay, so this is one of the actuators and you can see it is a very chunky, hefty piece of kit. It actually weighs in at 16 pounds or 7.26 kilograms. And uh, yeah, very, very solid piece of equipment here. You can see it does have these kind of captive feet on the bottom here. If you compare this to D-Box, it has little uh, little cast of feet that sit on the bottom and they sit in some little Teflon or Delrin cups and they can move around. With this guy, they are actually, I guess you could say semi-captive because the feet themselves don't fix to the ground, they don't bolt down. But you can see this does allow a little bit of movement. Now, of course, that's very important because as the rig moves up and down on these actuators, it will tilt from side to side, forward to back and whatnot. Some of the other motion systems that we've tested in the past just have basically like a foot, like the base of a chair almost, and it kind of just has to pivot around on that, and that can wear out over time, damage your floor and whatnot. So I do like this design here. There is the option of captive style feet like this with the D-Box systems, but that does come at an additional cost to a system which is already more expensive than what we're looking at here from Sigma Integrale. Now, you'll notice straight away the build quality here throughout. This is very much a no expense spared kind of approach to, uh, to the whole system. And you'll see as we get on through today's video, they really don't take any shortcuts anywhere in the approach to both the hardware and the software integration as well. So I'm really excited to show you what they do in terms of software a little bit later on in today's video too. So we've got this machined billet aluminium body here, which you can see has this kind of tumble finish, which gives it this texture. So basically they put it in a big barrel with some, some sort of material that basically rotates around like a big tumble dryer basically. And uh, it gives it this nice smooth finish, which I think looks quite nice. Now I have noticed a couple of pictures they've posted on their social media recently of uh, red finishes and black finishes. I believe they are an additional option on the DK6 system, but I haven't seen it advertised on the DK2 Plus yet, but I can imagine they probably will be adding that at some point. So uh, if that does change before we publish this video, we'll flash the details up on the screen for you guys, or if you're watching this later on down the line, just check their website. So uh, that would be an anodized finish over the top. And I believe on the DK6 system, it was an additional cost of 400 
US dollars according to my notes here. So yeah, hopefully that's accurate at the time that you're watching the video. But yeah, nice thick billet aluminium body there. We then have the uh, clear path motor sitting on the top of it as well. So this is basically just a very powerful motor that sits on the top of here, spins at, uh, what was it, 2,380 RPM at maximum. And then that goes down into what they describe as a premium THK ball screw for smooth performance and durability is what they say. So if we have a look inside here as well, there's a little Teflon sleeve which wraps around the outside of the 50 millimeter thick piston here on the bottom and that allows nice smooth action up and down. Now, one thing that I did notice with this is although it is a little bit on the loud side, it does sound quite noisy when it's running. We'll cover that later on. It does have very, very, very smooth uh, flow up and down. So you don't feel any sort of jerkiness or roboticness in that movement up and down. Very similar in that regard to both the Cubic system and the D-Box, which have always stood out to me as being some of the smoother options out of the ones that we've tried here at Boosted Media at least. So 50 millimeter thick piston, as you can see here. And if we spin the actuator around here, you'll notice this little bolt which goes in through the front here as well. So that is a locator that basically stops the piston from spinning around inside. So if we have a look at the piston here, you can see it's actually got a flat surface there and there's actually a little slot or like a keyway almost that's cut out in here that stops that piston from rotating around. So a pretty simple fundamental design overall, but obviously a lot of engineering and a lot of thought has gone into the way they design these to make sure that they're able to last a long time and continue to operate nice and smoothly. So it's good to see that material choice there using Teflon sleeves. So again, it kind of ties into what we were saying before about uh, the material choice basically coming down to what's gonna give the best performance rather than trying to build it to a particular price point. So then in terms of the motor itself, not really a whole lot to discuss here that is really of interest. You can see the unique heat sink design on the top of the unit here. Now that is very sharp, as Tom will tell you, when we reviewed the DK2, I think he stepped on it with bare feet. I don't know why he was driving with bare feet, but he stepped on it and actually uh, put one of these through the bottom of his foot, which wasn't great. So uh, don't ever don't ever step on these, not that you should be doing that anyway. I have no idea what Tom was doing that day. But interestingly, even having the settings cranked up way further than I would realistically drive with, these only ever got mildly warm to the touch, never got hot or anything like that. So obviously they've built in some, uh, some additional headroom over the top here of what they would ever be expecting. Now, obviously, as the payload goes up, uh, you know, the, the load on the motors would increase as well. So I can't guarantee that in your experience, it will stay under those same kinds of uh, temperatures as what we saw, but certainly seems to be plenty of headroom there. And that's definitely something that's good to see. Now, underneath this little uh, cover here, you'll notice a little micro USB connection. That is simply for updating the firmware on the motor, not something that you'll ever need to do. Uh, and there's also a little LED on there as well that flashes as an indicator light to let you know what's going on with the motor. We'll discuss that a little bit later on in today's video because it is something that stays active all the time, which I'm not a huge fan of, and I would prefer to have a solid cover over this so it's not flashing in your peripheral vision all the time. If we spin it around this way, I'll just pop it down on the table again so I'm not wobbling around and making it difficult for Tom. There's two connections down the bottom here. These are standard Molex connections, and each actuator is gonna have two of them, one providing data and one providing power. They are genuine Molex connections. They just clip in on each side like so and then those run back to the control module that we're gonna be looking at in just a moment. So very simple connections there as well. I do like the fact that those are removable. That's one complaint that I've always had with the D-Box systems, whether it's the G3 or the G5, their cabling is all integrated and it's all going through a grommet, which means if the cable does ever unfortunately get damaged, you are gonna be up for some kind of a more involved repair rather than just replacing a cable. So the trade off there is there is a little bit more cable spaghetti to deal with than you have with a D-Box. We'll talk about cable management when we talk about the control module in just a moment too. So that's pretty much everything you need to know in terms of the motor. In terms of mounting, very simple. Uh, this is their standard mounting bracket, which as you can see, bolts into the actuator and then has a standard mounting pattern to bolt onto any aluminum profile from uh, 40, 80 upwards. And you do get a slot there rather than a hole too. So if you're mounting in some sort of unconventional way, you shouldn't have too many difficulties there. There are extended brackets available at an additional cost from Sigma Integrale too, if you need those. But pretty straightforward, very simple. And they do include nice high quality mounting hardware as well so you shouldn't have any need to run off to a hardware store to get one of these guys installed which is, of course is the last thing you want to do when you're installing a nice shiny new product you just want to get up and driving as quickly as possible so that is the uh, that is the actuators obviously you get three of them with the three actuator system or four with the four system let's now take a closer look at the control module
So not really a whole lot to go through here, but let's just quickly run through the basics for you. Uh, you'll see on the front panel here, we've got our connections for each one of the four actuators. Those are labeled for each corner. So it is important that you plug the right location into the right port. Otherwise you could get some crazy motion going on. We've got our ethernet port here for connecting back to your PC over on the right hand side. Now they do include an RJ45 or a network cable for connecting back to your PC. One complaint that I do have, and I had the same complaint when we reviewed the DK2 system previously, they don't include a little USB USB to Ethernet adapter. Now, a lot of other motion systems, in fact, every other motion system that we've tested in the past here, other than the DK2, has either connected directly to PC via USB or included some sort of a little dongle or adapter to convert that network connection back to USB to plug into your PC. With this particular system, as you'll see in the software closer look in just a minute, you actually plug into your PC via Ethernet and then you have to put in a static IP address to connect to the box. What that means is that if you've only got a single network port on your PC and you're using that for connecting to your network at home or your internet, then you will have to buy a little uh, USB dongle to connect it. So I don't really understand why they don't include that in the package. Their reasoning for having that ethernet connection back to your PC is to minimize uh, the opportunity for any sort of interference or, uh, or any sort of latency coming into the system as opposed to USB. Obviously longer cable you have with USB, the more signal degradation you get, whereas you can get away with much longer cable runs with Cat5 or Cat6 cable. So that's their reasoning for it, but I would like to see for the price for them to include a a little, uh, a little ethernet adapter to connect to USB. So that is one little nitpick. Now it is quite a large box here. It comes in at 15 inches wide by 9.25 deep and three inches tall. There isn't any sort of provision for mounting here either, which is a complaint that I had when we reviewed the DK2 and exactly the same again with the DK2 Plus. Now the cables that they provide for connecting to each of the actuators aren't long enough that you can really set this aside off away from your rig at all. So it ends up kind of sitting underneath the rig at some point. Now they may want to keep this electrically isolated, which may be the reason why they don't want you to bolt it to the rig, but it would be nice even if they include some sort of a rubber membrane or something that they, or some sort of gasket that they could isolate it with but that would be a nice way to keep it up off the floor, make it a little bit less prone to picking up dirt and debris, dust and whatnot, and just make for a tidier install overall, at least in my opinion. Now, if we spin around to the back of the unit here as well, uh, not a whole lot going on here, but you can see there's a power switch. There is a fused uh, IEC connection here. And then you can see next to the IEC connection, there's a little switch for selecting your voltage. So it's not a switch mode power supply like what we see on most devices these days. You will just wanna make absolutely sure that you've got the correct voltage for your region selected there, or you might have have a nasty surprise when you power it on for the first time. Then over on the right hand side here, as you guys are looking at it, is a little cooling fan as well. One thing that I was impressed with with the DK2 system, and again here with the DK2 Plus, is that that fan is mounted on little rubber feet, which does isolate it from the shell. And that does make that cooling fan a little bit quieter in operation, doesn't send uh, vibrations through the entire shell and kind of echo. Although the cooling fan does still make a noticeable sound when the system is up and running. So I'll quickly pop the cover off this as well, give you a quick look inside, and then we'll jump over and get into to the software configuration. Okay, so I've removed the eight screws from the outside. Now, if I remember correctly from the DK2 that we looked at previously, yep, there's a power supply bolted to the upper shell. So we'll just quickly unplug these two connections here and that'll allow us to separate the two sides. So over on this side, you can see we've got a Technic Inc. Intelligent Power Center 5, which is a completely sealed power supply unit there. And that is able to operate with an input voltage of either 95 to 125 volts or 190 to 250 volts, which would be the reason for the switch that we saw. And that's able to operate at up to 1600 VA max. So yeah, nice sealed unit there. You can see again, the theme of that studded heatsink there. Obviously they're trying to keep the power supply as isolated as possible from the rest of the system. I don't believe there's a cooling fan inside that box itself. I think it's just the one cooling fan here, which kind of sits uh, just behind that. So you can imagine the fan is gonna be blowing through this section here and keeping everything cool. Again, just like what we said with the actuators, I didn't notice the shell of this getting warm at all when we were driving, which was good to see. Mentioned earlier as well, the fan being suspended on those little rubber feet. So you can see here how that fan is able to move around on its feet. So what else is going on inside the box? We've got an EMI filter over here for reducing any sort of electromagnetic interference as we would expect. So the power comes out of that filter, feeds into the main power distribution board, which is this guy here. And that then has a Meanwell, which is a brand that will be familiar to you if you've been watching this channel for a while. Uh, Meanwell IRM 10-5, which steps the voltage down for some components at least. So that steps it down 
from 100 to 240 volts AC down to five volts at a maximum of two amps. I'd imagine that the, uh, that the step down voltage would then be responsible for powering all of the control electronics over here. So this is where all the processing and whatnot takes place. And then from what I can tell here, it looks like the main AC is coming through this cable into the power supply module that we looked at earlier. And then the output of that is then fed back in. And that is what feeds the actual power to the motors. So pretty simple overall in its, in its layout when you break it down. In terms of the PCB for the control electronics, you can see here just how small that is. Uh, I did notice there's a little micro USB port on the front of it there, which is blocked out by the panel. So I'm assuming that's for some sort of a uh, firmware update process, which uh, isn't something that the user would need to do. There's also a little micro SD card on the back here as well, which is glued into place. So that is probably containing some sort of a firmware file as well, I would imagine. And not really a whole lot else to discuss here i don't think absolutely no complaints whatsoever with regards to quality everything is very well put together and uh yeah i think that's everything you need to know so let's head over onto the rig now and get into how it's all set up and how it's configured so let's have a quick tour now of the software and how you actually set this thing up on your PC. Now you'll remember earlier in the video, I showed you how you connect the uh, the control module to your PC via a RJ45 network cable. So the first thing you're gonna need to do is make some adjustments to your network adapter settings on your PC to get this up and running. As I mentioned earlier, I would recommend pick yourself up a USB uh, network adapter so you're not having to make adjustments to the main network adapter on your PC, assuming that you use it to connect it to your network at home. If you are using Wi-Fi, then you're fine to just use the built-in RJ45 on your motherboard. So we're gonna bring up our network connections control panel here. You can see I've got a bunch of network connections here. Uh, most of these are just leftovers from trying out various different VPNs and whatnot. But we've got our ethernet controller here, which is the one that's physically connected. And you can see it's showing at the moment that it's connected to an unidentified network. We're just gonna click down on properties. We're gonna to go to our IPv4 settings and hit properties here. And we're gonna put in the IP address that you see here. This is all covered in their instructions, so we don't need to go into a lot of detail here. But it's basically just a static IP address that allows it to communicate with the control module. That's it, you click OK. I'm getting a warning here because I have previously done this with a different network adapter, but you shouldn't get that warning. And uh, once you've done that, you should see that it's connected to the unidentified network. And if you've done it all correctly, you shouldn't even need to reboot. The Sigma Integrally Motion System software should connect to the control module and you'll be all up and running. So the next thing you need to do is put in a couple of measurements. So you're gonna to need to measure the physical distance between the actuators uh, side to side and front to rear as well. You're gonna click down on the rig tab here and just make sure you've got those exact measurements in. Once you've done all that, you can go back up to dash, click on power on and the system should fire up like so. So it's gonna center itself in the middle of the, uh, of the stroke. You'll see me slowly rising up here as it, uh, as it calibrates itself and now we are all up and running and active. So this is the basic dashboard, gives you a quick rundown of the settings that are in place. You can also change between different games or different profiles for each game here as well. It does automatically switch between different game profiles, which is really cool. So you don't have to go into the software and make changes every single time you change between different sims. It's something I always like to see. And yeah, basically this is just giving you a quick rundown with a bit of a log here as well. So you can see if there's any issues with the system. One other quick thing to mention here as well is if we go to settings and remote web UI, you can click on that and you can see that will give you a local IP address on your local network. You can then also log into this system via your tablet or smartphone. You simply just go to your browser of choice put in the IP address as you see it here, and that will vary depending on your particular system. So don't just copy mine, and that will give you all the exact same settings on your phone or your tablet as you can adjust here. That allows you to make changes on the fly without having to alt tab out of the game, which is a nice touch as well. So let's actually run through some of the settings that are available here quickly now. So you can see I've actually got a profile selected here called iRacing Test, which is some of the adjustments that I made to dial this in to feel the way I like it to feel. Motion is a very, very subjective thing. So you're more than welcome to copy my settings here for iRacing if you'd like to give them a try. They're basically just some minor tweaks over the top of what the basic uh, cooked in iRacing profile was that came directly from Sigma. So. My aim here is always to try and recreate the kind of forces that I would feel through the seat of the car, what I'm actually feeling in my body rather than trying to recreate the motion that the car's actually doing. We'll discuss that more when we get into driving a little bit later on. But just to give you the quick rundown on what we have here, you can change between profiles. As we said, you can save and export profiles too. So you can share profiles with your mates if you want to. There's no cloud-based system here, so you can't just load other people's profiles from the internet unless they send them to you or you're within a Discord community that shares them. We can also choose between the various different game profiles here as well. You can see there's a pretty extensive list of profiles for all the major 
titles that people are likely to be using with a motion system. And as I mentioned earlier, it will switch automatically between profiles when you change games as well, which is very nice. We then have all of our adjustments for the actual effects. So there is an advanced tuning tab here as well, which I haven't really messed with. This is more just sort of to do with timing and synchronization, things like that. Uh, if you want to get in and tweak at this kind of level, I would suggest just get in touch with the guys at Sigma. I'm sure they'll be able to talk you through it all beyond the scope of today's video though. Uh, but then we have adjustments for heave, global pitch and roll, pitch, and then tuning, then turning roll, environment, inclinations, vibrations, and engine vibrations. And we can make tweaks to each one of these different areas. There are tool tips available for each one of these as well. So that gives you a basic rundown of uh, what it is that you're adjusting here. And these are very well written. They're very descriptive and give you a nice explanation of what each thing is doing. But to give you a basic idea here, you've got an adjustment for intensity. That's the overall strength of the individual effect. So in this case, we are adjusting heave, which is up and down movement. We then have some smoothing filtering here. We've got elevation change, which it says increases to feel more rise and fall from elevation changes on the circuit. This applies to road racing, rally and flight, and then allocation as well, which it says the heave allocation can be adjusted to suit various scenarios and rig setups. The remaining travel is then used for pitch and roll layers. So again, I pretty much just went with the, with the basic cooked in settings here and just changed the intensity a little bit. I felt that that gave me all the sensations that uh, I was wanting to feel and I really just didn't feel a need to really tweak beyond that. I did make a couple of adjustments just to see what it did, but yeah, I was happy with the basic settings. We've then got an adjustment for our global pitch and roll. This says it changes the intensities and allocations for all the pitch and roll layers. So pretty self-explanatory there as well. We then got a separate adjustment for pitch. This layer generates responsive pitch during acceleration, deceleration, and gear shifts. The pitch generated from this layer is added on top of the pitch generated from the environment layer. So great that they give you that explanation so you understand where it falls in the hierarchy of effects as well. And then you can see here the breakdown of various adjustments that we have within this as well. So acceleration, deceleration, gear shift intensity. That's an effect that I always really enjoy. So I've got that cranked up a little bit higher than some other people might wanna have. Again, We've got some smoothing filtering for both of those as well. Then we get down into turning roll. This layer generates responsive roll during lateral acceleration, which occurs during turning and traction loss. The roll generated from this layer is added on top of the roll generated from the environment layer once again. And just the same again, we've got an intensity adjustment as well as a smoothing adjustment. So if it's feeling a little bit robotic to you, you can crank up the smoothing, but I didn't find that this platform felt robotic at all under any scenario really. So I was really impressed by that. We then get down into environment. This layer is the true pitch and roll of the game vehicle or aircraft. So again, similar adjustments here, intensity and smoothing. We then have inclinations. The inclinations allow sustained pitch while climbing hills and sustained roll while driving through banks. For aircraft, this layer allows sustained pitch and roll orientations. The setting also affects the overall percentage of allocation for the pitch and roll layers. Then we get down into vibrations. So powered by True Haptics trademark, these layers analyze game data for vibration waves and sends them to the controller for accurate real-time playback. As soon as half the wave is detected, it is sent immediately to the controller to minimize delay. Each half wave is produced by the game and accurately played by the controller. This authentic approach means there are no effects played. So that's getting back into what we were discussing a little bit earlier about canned effects versus actual telemetry based effects. And again, in my experience, this has been really great with this particular platform, assuming again that the sim actually does generate those effects in the first place. But we'll discuss that more once again when we get into our final conclusions. The controller utilizes Texas Instruments real-time OS or RTOS to simulate vibrations accurately at a thousand hertz sampling rate. So there you go. So once again, we do have some advanced tuning options here. I didn't find that I really needed to make any major adjustments here. I did fill around with them a bit, but I was happy with the default settings. Again, we've got tool tips explaining exactly what those do. And then we've got adjustments here for our medium intensity as well as high intensity. Now, one of the suggestions that they made to me was that if you really want to feel the effects of running up over ripple strips, for example, uh, you can crank up the high intensity effects. I found that uh, cranking that all the way up to 10 was a little bit too intense for me. It was rattling my teeth and shaking up my stomach to the point that I was actually starting to feel sick. So seven felt pretty good for me. And then you've got a sensitivity adjustment for each of these as well, which I did end up cranking up to maximum. And then finally, we've got engine vibration Again, pretty self-explanatory here. We've got an adjustment for overall intensity as well as distribution front to rear. So if you're driving a front engine car, you wanna feel more of it in the front or a rear engine car, you wanna feel more of it in the rear, you can make that adjustment here 
as well. So that's a basic rundown for you on all of the settings that you can adjust. We already touched on the rig measurements before. Log is simply just a log reported back from the motion controller. So you can see if there's any issues or what state it's currently in. And if we click on settings once more, we already talked about remote UI. Uh, there are some automation things you can do here to adjust how the thing behaves when there's no telemetry coming in. So for example, you can have an automatic power off if you want to, alarm recovery, app launch, and you know all that basic kind of stuff there. There are some adjustments here for game settings as well for uh, the ports that it uses to read telemetry coming out of the game. So if you have some sort of a conflict, you can make adjustments here as well as need be. Generally speaking though, I haven't had any issues. Everything just worked straight out of the box, which was really nice. It didn't have to make any adjustments to INI files inside any of the games that we tested this with either. And we did test it with pretty much everything. So that was all good. Uh, one more thing I will mention here, we'll get into this when we get into the driving experience uh, very shortly, but they do have a tab here for VR motion compensation. It does say coming soon. So that's definitely something that we'll try to experiment with into the future. But let's move on now from the software side of things and talk about what this platform is actually like to drive with. So let's spend a bit of time now unpacking the driving experience with the Sigma Integrale DK2 Plus. Now over the years, we've uh, we've done extensive testing with a bunch of different types of motion systems from things like the Next Level Racing Seat Mover all the way through to the crazy uh, Cubic Systems QSV20 that you see behind me, which we did a video on just recently on the channel, which you should definitely check out if you're into motion systems. So massive variation in the cost between those two extremes. And we've tested a bunch of stuff in between, including the Sigma Integrale DK2, which is the next model down from the one that we're sitting on now. We've also tested the uh, D-Box G3, which I run on my daily driver rig, and of course the G5, which is more recent, but the effects are all the same with that particular setup. So I've got a pretty decent amount of experience across a wide variety of different types of motion systems. So the DK2 Plus system definitely does feel more violent and more aggressive overall than the DK2 did. But having said that, the DK2 certainly didn't feel like it was lacking in any way in the overall experience for me either. And if you go back and watch that review video, you'll see that I didn't actually end up running any of the settings maxed out on that particular rig. Now, of course, motion is a very subjective thing. My philosophy, as I touched on earlier on the video, is very much trying to recreate the kinds of feelings that you'd actually feel in the seat of your pants when you're driving a race car, rather than actually trying to treat each actuator as the suspension strut in each corner of the car. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of trip up with this stuff. They try to make the rig move like the car does in real life. Whereas in reality, at least in my personal opinion, what you're really wanting to try and do is recreate those effects that you would feel through the seat. So the two kind of do go hand in hand to a point, but you certainly don't need to be throwing the rig around to the same extent that you would see a car moving around in the real world to get those same kind of feelings through the seat of the pants. And the other aspect to that as well, I think that's important to understand is that you never want to get into a situation. We talked about this quite a bit with uh, with strength with regards to force feedback recently in a steering wheel, but also with regards to motion, maybe even more so with motion. You don't want to get into a situation where the car is driving you rather than you driving the car. And there's a very fine line between giving your body additional cues that it can use to understand and uh, compute what's going on with the car versus just getting thrown around to the extent where you just completely lose control and your muscle inputs in your controls end up becoming explosive just to overcome the amount that you're being thrown around inside the rig. Hopefully that makes sense. So my philosophy is always very much give myself the cues that I need to drive quickly and consistently, but not so much to the extent that it's just completely throwing me around inside the car. But you might prefer to be thrown around inside the car. So it really just comes down to your own subjective personal preference. For me personally, in terms of just the raw driving experience and what I like to feel through the seat of the pants, I wouldn't say that it'd be worth it for me personally to step up to the DK2 Plus over the DK2. But the other factor that's of course really important to consider there as well is the overall payload capacity. And that is quite a lot more with the DK2 Plus as it is with the DK2 as we discussed earlier on in the video. So it is of course always a good idea to have a little bit of headroom. You will also want to consider are you likely to add extra peripherals over time to your rig? Are you likely to upgrade your wheelbase to something much heavier, put a heavier seat on, maybe add some button boxes? It does add up quite quickly because of course the payload weight also includes the weight of the person actually sitting in the rig as well. And in my case that makes up about half of the rig because I need to lose some weight. So I think that pretty much covers everything I can in terms of the comparison between the experience driving with the DK2 and the DK2 Plus. Uh, it would have been great to be able to do complete back-to-back -back comparisons side by side, but unfortunately we just can't do that because we don't have the DK2 here anymore. But let's talk about how the experience driving with this actually compares to some of the other competitor products available in the market. Now, of course, we haven't tested every single system out there, but I wanted to highlight some of the things that stood out to me in particular about this system and of course with the DK2 as well. So the first thing that jumps out is the, uh, the raw kind of purest approach that they've taken to the development of this 
product does really shine through just like it did with the DK2 when we reviewed that. So what I mean by that is the raw effects that you feel, things like just the engine vibration, the sensation of going over curves, cracks in the road and whatnot, all feel very, very, very detailed. Now, in case you missed it earlier on in the review, the philosophy here is that they are using raw telemetry coming out of the sim racing titles to actually generate all of the things that you're feeling through these actuators. Unlike what you see with some of the other systems on the market, particularly the D-Box system, which does rely quite heavily on canned effects or processed effects. So basically what it does is it will detect that you're going over a rumble strip and it will play a rumble strip type effect through the motion platform rather than actually using the laser scan data on the track itself to generate those effects. So what that means is uh, you do get much more authentic feeling effects through this platform than you do on the D-Box platform. But that does come with one big caveat and that is that it does rely on the sim or the track actually having that data in it to begin with. So the flip side to all of this is that the D-Box systems do provide a more consistent overall driving experience than what you get with either the DK2 or the DK2 Plus. And that is simply just down to not every track is scanned in the same way. Not every track has the same amount of detail. Not every sim represents that data in the same way either. So what I would say is for the tracks that do a particularly good job of laser scanning, so say Sebring for example, Okayama is another good one, the amount of detail that you feel on those circuits is absolutely incredible with this particular rig. But then if you jump on a track like Spa for example, you'll notice that when you run up over some of the ripple strips, you actually don't feel any of that rumble effects through the rig at all, whereas on the D-Box system, you do get a consistent feeling across all of those rumble strips for the most part anyway. So, and again, that, that does translate across between different sim racing titles too. I did find when I was driving in uh, F123, for example, which doesn't use laser scanning, doesn't have anywhere near the same amount of detail coming through, the experience driving with this wasn't as immersive overall as the D-Box system is. So I think if you're, a, if you're a purist that only wants to have the rawest of the raw kind of effects coming through your platform, then this kind of becomes the obvious choice for you, I would say. Whereas if you're after a more consistent overall experience across the board, then maybe the D-Box is gonna be a better experience overall for you. I would say, just to reiterate again for you, in scenarios where everything is done right, this is the better feeling platform in my subjective opinion. But in terms of overall consistency between different tracks and sim racing platforms, the D-Box I think does a better job overall. The hardware itself these days actually feels like it's one or two generations ahead of where we're at with the actual sim racing titles, both with force feedback through a wheel and through these motion systems. And I'm probably gonna be making another video I think pretty soon talking about all this in relation to wheelbases as well because it's definitely an important consideration and something that we've really noticed over the course of the last probably 18 months or so is where this sort of really started to stand out to me. So I did spend a number of weeks testing this guy across a variety of different sim racing titles from the more sort of sim K titles like F123 as we were talking about before all the way through to you know your iRacing your ACC your uh, Le Mans Ultimate for example and you know pretty much everything in between and look the, the the driving experience across the titles was more inconsistent than it is with the D-Box system but it still did provide an overall good driving experience but I would definitely say ACC and iRacing in particular are probably the two standout ones uh, particularly iRacing with their uh, with their fully laser scan tracks like uh, Okayama or uh, Sabring, for example. Those did give an absolutely outstanding experience overall. But across the board, there were no issues with anything like lag or latency or any sort of sensation of disconnection between what I was feeling through my body, what I was feeling through the steering wheel and what I was actually seeing on the screen. Now, of course, without motion and the seat of the pants feeling that we get from that, uh, we do rely in sim racing a lot more on the visual cues than what we would in a real life race car. And of course, when you have bad quality force feedback, you instantly feel disconnected from what the car's doing and it actually will end up making you slower than not having force feedback at all. And very similar with motion systems as well. If you've got things set up badly or you've got a really slow laggy motion system, it does just end up taking away from the experience. It might look cool on camera and it might really throw you around, but in terms of actually feeling what you need to feel through the car to drive quickly and consistently, it can actually be detrimental to the experience rather than something that benefits you. Now, I wouldn't go as far as saying that this system or any other motion system that I've tested has actually made me faster and more consistent, but definitely in terms of immersion, there was nothing immersion breaking about the experience driving with this at all, even on some of those worst combinations where we didn't have the same quality effects as what we had with those fully laser scan tracks. Uh, yeah, no issues at all with latency or lag or anything like that. Everything felt very, very nice. And that goes for the experience in VR as well. Now, a couple of the motion systems that we've tested in the past do have built-in motion compensation for VR. That is something
something that I've never really felt that I needed at the effects levels that I like to run on my motion platforms. Again, remembering that I don't like to be thrown around to the extent where the car starts to drive me rather than me driving the car. We have played around with uh, with the VR motion compensation on the Cubic systems a little bit. Uh, we will be covering that in the full review of the QS V20 very soon. But basically the problem that you have with motion systems and VR is that as the rig moves around, obviously your body moves around. And then of course your relative position will also be moved around too, which means that your perspective can start to bounce around a little bit more than it should inside the car. Now, of course, in reality, you do bounce around and move around in the cabin of a real life car anyways. And with the effect levels that I was running on this particular platform, I didn't find it to be a problem for me at all. I never got into a scenario where I felt like I was floating around inside the car and things began to feel disconnected. So I didn't really feel like it was necessary. That said, it is something that they are adding. You saw in the software look earlier on that they said that that was coming soon. So it will definitely be interesting to experiment with that when we get the opportunity, but certainly not something that I would say at this point in time, uh, running at sensible effect levels at least is a deal breaker so you know if you're trying to toss up between this and something else and you go oh well that one has vr compensation and this one doesn't in my experience i don't really think that it's a major factor but you may disagree with me and of course if you're liking massive amounts of movement that really kind of sway you around if maybe you're doing stadium truck racing or something like that it might become more of a thing. But in my experience, at least that certainly wasn't a deal breaker. So I think to summarize the driving experience here, really it just comes down to if you're a purist that only wants the rawest of raw feedback coming through the seat of the pants, then I think this is probably the best option available on the market right now, at least that we've tested. Uh, if you're after that more consistent experience across a variety of different sim racing titles from Simcade all the way through to hardcore simulation, then something like a D-Box is probably gonna be the better choice for you. But this does still do an excellent job across the board. Now we do have a couple of little little nitpicks with regards to the overall system and the integration as well. So we'll just quickly run you through those before we wrap things up here. So the thing that I think is probably most important to highlight here is that this is a relatively noisy system. And we found that with the DK2 that we tested as well. Now, if you've seen that review, you'll remember I mentioned that there was like a clicking noise or like a rotating noise that you could hear. Now they did tell us that that had been uh, sorted out for future revisions. We didn't have the ticking noise with these particular actuators, but we do still hear that kind of whirring, almost like a spinning sound that you can hear all the time in the background when this is running. That isn't something that's present on any of the other motion systems that we've tested here. So we do have to put that in context and look, any motion system is quite loud when it's operating, loud enough that if you've got somebody trying to sleep or study in a room right next to you, then you're probably not gonna be able to run the motion anyway. If you're up on a second floor or in an apartment, then that's something that you're definitely gonna have to consider with any motion system. But having said that, this one is definitely a little bit louder than some of the other ones that we've tested. Now, the other thing that annoyed me a little bit, and this is, this is certainly not a deal breaker, but the flashing lights that you have on top of the motors are kind of in your visual field all the time. Obviously for diagnostic use, they can be handy, but you just don't need to have them flashing all the time, I don't think. So that's one little tiny nitpick. Likewise, as we mentioned with the DK2 system when we reviewed that, the wiring is uh, not long enough that you can really have the control module mounted off to the side somewhere. So it does kind of end up needing to be underneath the rig. Now, I'm not sure whether it does need to be electrically isolated from the rig, but I would have liked to have had some way of actually mounting it to the chassis itself. So it's not just kind of sitting there underneath the rig. So that was one small nitpick as well. Uh, other systems like the D-Box systems do have ways of actually mounting those control modules to the rig itself. Or in the case of the G5 D-Box, uh, all of the electronics are actually integrated into each individual module, each individual actuator itself. So you don't even need to have a control box other than just a little USB thing. The other minor complaint that I did have as well is I'm not a big fan of the uh, of the ethernet connection to the PC. We discussed the reasons for that earlier on in the video. So you can go back and check that out if you're wanting more information on that. But at the very least, I would have liked them to include a little USB um, ethernet adapter, just so you're not having to take up the only ethernet port on your motherboard. Now I know a lot of people these days do have their PCs connected to their network via Wi-Fi. Not some Something that I would generally recommend for any type of online gaming, just because you do get a little bit more latency, a little bit more variation there. So for sim racing, I generally try to have my PC hardwired to my network and I would suggest that everybody does the same. So I would for that reason recommend that you do go out and buy yourself a USB uh, ethernet adapter just so you're not taking up that network port. But overall, I would say they've done a really good job here. And I also just wanna mention in closing as well, just how 
how refreshing the experience of actually dealing with the team at Sigma Integrale has been as well. They're obviously extremely passionate about what they do. That passion shines through in just how enthusiastic they are to share their development. Uh, you know, we've remained in pretty close contact with them for a number of years now and sort of, you know, keeping an eye on the development of their products. And yeah, it's been really great to see, you know, a group of people that are obviously passionate about sim racing, passionate about the products that they're developing and really wanting to give sim racers the best possible experience with their products rather than focusing primarily just on raw profits. And I think that that is something that we should be celebrating as a community. So I thought it was worth mentioning in the video. So overall, absolutely no reason not to recommend this system. Of course, just be aware of the things that we've highlighted in today's video. So I really hope that today's video has helped you out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel as well so you don't miss out on future videos like this one. We do have more content coming on the QSV20 system from Cubic Systems very soon as well. So that is a very good excuse to be subscribed to the channel if you're not already. But as always, thank you very much for watching guys and I will see you again soon. Bye.